Yeah. You want to get close up on the screen, but if I'm like writing something on the board, then switch it to me. Making sense? All right. Ready? Go for it. Action. This is uh, chapter nine. We're talking about the currents of the ocean. Y'all might have noticed that the current was really strong the other day. That's what we're talking about, the currents, ocean currents. Now, on a global scale, the ocean moves, and a lot of that movement is due to what we call the Coriolis effect. Can you say Coriolis effect? Coriolis effect. It comes from the fact that the Earth is spinning. If the Earth weren't spinning, if it were still, the water wouldn't move near as much. But imagine if you take the Earth as still, and then you start spinning it, the water's going to move around on it. <laughs> and it all moves around in a certain way. It moves around in circles to the right in the northern hemisphere, and circles to the left in the southern hemisphere. And it has to do with the rotation of the Earth on its axis. axis. We call this the Coriolis effect. And it, it happens not only with water, it happens with flying objects. They teach snipers. If you're going to become a, a, an army sniper, when you shoot a bullet, if you're shooting a bullet in the northern hemisphere, it's going to move a little to the right if it's a real long shot. And if you're hit shooting in the southern hemisphere, it's going to go a little to the left. Because what's happening is the earth is spinning under the bullet. You shoot the bullet, so the it bullet's goes flying not off, and the earth actually moves under the bullet while the bullet is traveling. Now, with a bullet, since it's only in the air for a short amount of time, it's not very much. But for a mile-long shot, it might be that much. And if you're going to hit someone in the right spot, you've got to correct for that. But more often, it's corrected for in something that goes a long way, like a long plane flight. They have to correct for the Coriolis effect. They can't just aim out there... Uh, at Atlanta from New York, they have to understand that they're going to move a little right along the way as the earth spins, and they correct for that Coriolis effect. And the water does that too. The water curves around to the right a little bit. Video footage. Okay. Coriolis effect. An object in motion appears to be deflected from its course as if a force is pulling it sideways. To demonstrate this point, let's imagine a game of catch being played by two people on a merry-go-round that spins like the earth, but is flat. Without rotation, the ball appears to follow a straight path from thrower to catcher. Imagine the ball is tossed from the center <coughs> to someone at the edge. With rotation, the ball still travels in a straight line in space. But because the catcher is moving, the ball misses. From the vantage point of the catcher, the ball appears to curve away. The direction of apparent motion is to the right when following the path of the ball. Now the ball is thrown the other way. Because the thrower is moving, the ball has a velocity component to the right. The motion of the ball appears deflected to the right, and the ball misses the catcher again. Let's look at a throw across the merry-go-round. Both people move with the merry-go-round. The ball is thrown. Although it flies straight, it appears to be deflected from its original path. Apparent deflection increases as the ball travels farther. In the southern hemisphere, <coughs> rotation is clockwise when viewed from over the pole. Again, the ball follows a straight course, but its apparent flight path is diverted. This time, the effect is to divert the motion to the left. On Earth, all free moving objects, including masses of air, are subject to the Coriolis effect. In the northern hemisphere, objects are diverted to the right, as viewed from the direction of original movement. In the southern hemisphere, the deflection is to the left. Sweet. 
Bobby, you want to see the Coriolis free throw? Yes. Yeah, the one nothing. Uh, of course. It's why, yeah. You think I'm the one that... <laughs> It's funny how threats turn into promises. Way too much fun. You gave me a set. I'll tell you what the problem is. All these questions and ladies got the answers. Cause I've got with the fly when the fly was unique. <laughs> <laughs> that was terrible. Oh, you're how, cool. How the ball curves in the air? You're cool. Huge overcome. Just throw that guy in front of him. Dang. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> he has such focus. Why is he a goggle in the eye? Were you garbage? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Tighten it up. That's what shot looks like. That was fun. Okay, we gotta move on. I don't want to move on just yet. So things tend to curve because of the movement of the Earth. Just remember, it's always to the right in the northern hemisphere. It's always to the left in the southern hemisphere. Wind patterns. Now, wind does the same thing. Wind will also curve to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. But we also have to keep in mind that winds rise over the hottest part of the globe, over the equator, and then they fall once they cool off high in the atmosphere. So that's why it shows these these wind patterns stuck out, rising over the equator and then falling. Um, uh, and so you have this circulation of air, let's look over here, arising over the equator, going across, and then falling at about 30 degrees latitude. So you get these global wind patterns, and we have names for them. The ones near the equator are called the trade winds. The ones north of the 30 degree line are the westerlies. You see they have southern westerlies and uh, northern westerlies. And then finally, uh, at the uh, near the poles, you have the polar cells. Um, we don't have to worry about those, but just remember, if you just know the trades and the westerlies, those are names of two um, wind pat two global wind patterns that, like water, wind is influenced by the Coriolis effect. This end, we're going to look at uh, global wind patterns and talk about the reasons why the air circulates the way it does, and also patterns of rising and sinking air and how that relates to precipitation. The engine that drives it all, I guess you could say, is the intense heating by the sun that occurs only in the equator areas, where the sun is shining at a very high angle of incidence. And this hot air near the equator, being less dense, rises upward. It rises upward and it moves toward the poles, and then it gradually sinks at about 30 degrees north and south latitude. So we create these big spinning circles of the air. That shows it really good. Themselves. Now, near the equator where the air is rising, it loses its ability to hold moisture and you get a band of high rainfall and low pressure because there's air leaving the equator. Where the air sinks in these it belts at around 30 degrees north and south, you get high pressure sinking air which creates areas of clear skies and desert plains. Now, um, as this air circulates in the equator along the surface, <laughs> what is that? Uh, Oh, it's these guys out here playing with balls. Balls? Balls are cool. <laughs> 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 Alright, so we're going to 
<laughs> it's funny how threats turn into promises. The Corey Wilson effect, the spin of the earth, causes it to bend and turn, and it's going to create two big wind belts that prevail on our earth, uh, two out of three. The so here, I'll mute it. Um, so the, the air is rising, cooling, and then falling. And so there's a circular pattern, and if you extend that out, you can see that not only does it go back toward the equator, but it curves to the right in the northern hemisphere. So these are the trade winds. They're all curved to the right. And then north of 38, they kind of curve to the left, like that. That's when find that out. Measuring the wind in different locations, putting it all together. Isn't that cool? Yes. You got to know this stuff if you're going to be a sailor. And so they actually figured this out a long time ago. Because they used to sail around the world, right? They still do, I guess. That was four planes. Bill Nye. Bill, Bill, So, here's a question that you probably won't get right. If the wind is blowing over the water, Go, let's say there's, let's say, let's say where the floor is is water, and the wind's blowing that way. Which way is that going to push the water? The opposite way. It is. Is that about the like? Wouldn't you think it'd be the same direction that the wind's going? No. If the wind's going this way, wouldn't the water go that way? No, not today. It is true that it does. I knew y'all missed that. Why would you? Yeah, do that? it goes that way, but oh. only on the top. You finessed. Only on the top does it go that it way. Has nothing to do with time. A little bit underneath, the water is curving to the right because we call it Coriolis effect. And we call this idea, we call it Ekman transport. So <coughs> the surface, the wind blowing this way, the surface water tends to go the direction of the wind, but as you go deeper, you see it curving to the right more. And the deeper you get, the more it curves to the right. And then way down deep, it's actually going uh, almost backwards from the original direction of the wind. And if you, if you put all of these uh, vectors together, you see that if the wind's blowing that way, the water is actually going to be transported to the right in the northern hemisphere. So if the wind's blowing this way, the water is going to go that way because the Coriolis effect, the, the, water, the, the overall current of the water. We call that Ekman transport. It's not going straight with the wind, it's going to the right. And in the southern hemisphere, if the wind's blowing this way, the water goes to the left. So you think out there when you're looking at the water in the ocean and you're going, okay, the wind's blowing this way, I guess the water's also going that way. Not necessarily true. It's going to the right of the wind direction. Isn't that cool? Yes. That's something you didn't know about the ocean. That's why you're in here learning stuff. I think you're missing a thing for your lunch. Bam! Ooh, okay. Video footage of Ekman Transport. Yay. <coughs> oh, man. Way back here. Sometimes it plays on the right side, and sometimes it plays on the wrong side. <laughs> We need to start out. Pay attention, extra transport. Okay. In the kitchen, water whipping. My tides flipping. Played. Yes. That's a terrible video. I apologize for it. Redo it. Can yeah, you play it again? No, it was awful. <laughs> okay, Played. gyres. Yeah. Gyres are large circular currents. There's five of them on the planet. Can you say gyre? Gyre. 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 It's a large circular current of water. And we have next to us um, the uh, North Equatorial Current that comes up from the equator, hot water coming up, turning to the right because of the Coriolis effect, and doing a big loop like this. One of those currents, 
that's kind of near to our shores called the Gulf Stream. You ever heard of the Gulf Stream? Yeah. And it comes up on, and goes up towards England, and it kind of helps keep the water around England a lot warmer than it would be if you didn't have this Gulf Stream. Is blue where it gets cold? Blue is it's gotten cold and it's coming back down. So you can see, if you go, uh, try going swimming in California ocean water next time you're over there. Warm water comes up and goes off the coast of Asia here and then gets way up north by Alaska and gets real cold and then comes down because it's because this big gyre here and uh, cools the, the water off the coast of California. It's real cold. Go, you need a wetsuit, really, visit, Mark. unless you're really tough, which I am, but you all probably aren't. And uh, you can... You need a wetsuit probably to swim in that ocean water. It's so cold. Ours is a lot warmer than there. That's why we're better than them. We hear about yeah, strange things from distant places being washed up on our shores all the time. Uh, it was but how do they get there? Oh, no. Ocean currents are the movements of surface water in the oceans. Their direction is influenced by many factors, Ooh. including oh, the rotation, the size of the continents, the You're an animal. and even yeah, water density. What you do with it. You're the goat. Ocean currents caused by prevailing winds are called drift currents. In the northern hemisphere, the circulation of the oceans is clockwise, and in the southern hemisphere, clockwise. the currents are anti-clockwise. Anti -clockwise. Currents originating from the polar regions carry cold water. There's the California current, the Peru or Humboldt current, the Labrador, Canaries, Benguela, the Antarctic... This is an important current when we're talking about marine biology. Whala. The Galapagos Islands, which sit right about here, have penguins on them. Penguins on the Galapagos Islands, which is right on the equator. Did you know there's penguins on the equator? I do. How can penguins be there? Well, it's a cold current. That it's called the Humboldt Current. It comes up from Antarctica. That's where penguins are, live. And it comes up here like this. And so the water in, in at the Galapagos is actually cold because it has come up from Antarctica. And it's not warm yet. And so penguins came with it millions of years ago. Probably in a storm or something, they got blown Amazing. and ca carried by the water, and and right. now they're at the Galapagos, and they've changed in the millions of years that they've been there, so they don't look like the penguins that are on these islands. But that's how they got there. So Where's the hottest water? The hottest water? Caribbean. Uh, yeah, Caribbean water is not just there, but um, wherever. Uh, if you go back to look at the uh, African water. Look at the. Uh, hold on, let's go back. Cold so water. wherever you see the red lines, that's hot. So any any of these uh, these areas around the red, so Caribbean is going to be very warm because it's hot, warm water coming up from the equator. But these islands too will be warm. Interesting stuff. Of course, you put the. You put the land in the way of the ocean, and that actually redirects a lot of the currents. So the, the, the ocean currents are very... Uh, um, chopped and skewed. Cho they're chopped up. They're haphazard. In, in any particular place, they're not as easy to predict because of all the land that's in the way. So there's a paragraph in your reading about the shape of the ocean basins changes the way the water flows around. So it's not a nice, neat circle like that other picture shows. The currents actually get broken up by the, the land that's in the way. There's the Gulf Stream. Yay, that's where we are. Is that why they don't know where it is? Because that stream right there? Uh, no, they built it there because it was so thin right there. Yeah. That's the only place they could cut through it was thin enough. And it still took 20 years, whatever it was. The last thing I want to talk about is thermohaline <coughs> circulation. Can you say thermohaline? Thermohaline. So the idea here is that let's take our warm water from the Gulf Stream. It goes up and it goes up and it goes up like this. And then a lot of it, now a lot of it turns in circles on the surface, but a lot of it will fall down deep. And the reason why is when this ocean water cools, a lot of it freezes into icebergs. And what
what's left is very salty water, because icebergs are fresh water. So a lot of the fresh water freezes, and you're left with the water being a lot more salty. And so a lot of it will dive real deep, because, because the salt water is heavy, and it goes down deep into the ocean. In this location right here, there are billions of gallons of water falling at all times down really deep. And then that circulates at real deep levels. Deep water circulates under the ocean. And you can follow this uh, blue line. That's all real deep. And finally, when it gets back near the equator, back around here around Africa, it gets lighter again because it gets warmer and it comes up to the surface. And uh, it'll stay on the surface, go back around here, and then when it gets cold again, it'll, it'll fall again. Some of it, if you follow the arrows along, stays down near the bottom, goes off the coast of, uh, of uh, Antarctica here, and some of it swirls all the way up, comes all the way up the Pacific, and then finally gets go, comes back high up again. We call this entire uh, circulation, some of it being shallow, the red being shallow, the blue being deep, we call this the great ocean conveyor. It's like a conveyor belt where the water will move shallow and then will fall down deep. And it takes hundreds of years to make a single loop for the water, maybe thousands of years. Does anyone have the reading open? Does it say how many years it takes the water to Four do a, how much? Four thousand. 4,000 years. If you're water and you're just following water molecules, it, it'll take 4,000 years to go all the way around the world once. So it's kind of a slow circulation. So you're saying that all water has been everywhere? That's right. All water has been everywhere in the four billion years the Earth's been here. It circulates all over the place. Video footage of thermohaline circulation? It's way of you. Yeah. Let's see if he can go two for two. Boiling. Oh, God. I'm getting better at this. Oh, this is one of the most beautiful videos. This is made by NASA. This is what this is what NASA scientists do in their spare time. There's no uh, there's no sound to it. Showing you air currents here. No, I'm sorry. Ocean currents, the thermohaline circulation. So here is the the uh, surface, and there it's falling down and going back under. Surface and down deep. Let me back this up a little bit. Let's wow. turn this over. This is pretty here. Okay, so here's the ocean. The arrows there are on the surface, and then there's deep arrows underneath. I don't know if you can see them. They're kind of in shadow. So the surface currents go up. The water freezes, and it comes back down. Isn't that cool? It goes back down, and this is now traveling deep. All these arrows are deep under the surface. Again, this is a slow current. They've sped this up huge amounts. It takes 4,000 years to get all the way around the Earth for this water. It's a giant conveyor system that moves water slowly from shallow to deep. It goes all around the planet. It's called the Great Ocean Conveyor. And the whole idea is called thermohaline. Haline meaning salt, thermo meaning temperature. It's a combination of the temperature and the saltiness that moves the water. Oh, it's beautiful. Sir. Isn't that great? Okay. Indeed. Hold on, I got some other things about currents. So, um, this is showing uh, what water does when it hits the shore. And the water is usually coming to the shore at an angle, not straight on. The wind blows, remember the surface waters kind of go in the direction of the wind, although slightly to the right. The deep waters go to the right. <coughs> 
and some of them even, if you get deep enough, go backwards. But the surface waters will blow at an angle towards the uh, towards the land, and they'll hit the land, and then they'll go back, and they'll hit the land, and then they'll go back. And that's what is happening at the beach if you're out there. Y'all notice how the waves come in at an angle? And um, this, this when, the, when the waters are going back, this backwash here, we have a name for water that's going back like that. It's called a rip current. You ever heard about rip currents? Yep. You got to be careful about rip currents. They can drag you offshore. And um, that's this water that's going back like this. And what this ends up doing, we call this whole movement of water that kind of goes to the right, or well, in this picture, it could be going to the left if the water is coming in from the other direction. We call it longshore drift. And it'll move sand, because this water will scour sand away and pull sand out to sandbars, and then push it back in and move it back out, and push it back in and move it back out. The sand will move along with, uh, just very slowly over the course of time, the sand will move along the beach. We have that happening right now at our beach. I don't know if y'all noticed this, but if you go out right now to Coast Guard, there's a whole lot of sand there. It goes way out. Have y'all noticed that at Coast Guard Beach? Yes. That wasn't like that four or five years ago. The sand was was more up East Beach, and Coast Guard was not that wide. That sand is moving. It's moving slowly along as the as the current carries it. And from our beach, it goes from left to right. So as you're walking out Coast Guard Beach, the sand is moving that way and the longshore currents are moving that way. So um, carrying the, uh, the longshore drift or longshore currents are moving down the beach here um, at St. Simon's, pulling, pulling the uh, sand with it. This is an example of a rip current. Rip currents happen between sandbars. The ocean, uh, as the tide's coming in, the, the uh, water comes over the sandbars. But when the water goes back out, it goes under. Underneath, it's a little bit deeper. So the surface water is coming in, and, but the, the current goes out underneath it, and the current goes between the sandbars. So between that sandbar, you'll have a strong rip current coming out and pulling water out, and then it kind of diffuses away. If you're stuck right there swimming, you'll feel that current pull you hard out. When people get in trouble is when they try to swim against the current because it's too strong. And so if you're ever getting pulled out real fast by a rip current, what you do is you swim to the side, and you'll swim out of that rip current pretty quickly. And then you try to swim in. Um, you might be a few hundred yards out at that point. But if you wear yourself out trying to swim against this current, eventually you go down and drown. People who live in beaches have heard that before, and it usually doesn't hurt them. It's usually tourists that end up, people from out of town, and they don't know, and they all of a sudden get swept out, and they're trying to swim against it, and they just keep swimming against it, and they eventually wear out, especially if there's no life. Do you ever watch that happen so many degrees? Yes. Y'all heard about rip currents? Is that popular? Yeah. You swim parallel, and you'll get out of it. You could also just float with it and come out past the sandbars, and then it'll, the current dies down there, and then you would have a whole long way to swim, but you could probably make it back if you didn't wear yourself out trying to swim against the current, especially if you're on a board or something like that. But around here, uh, that can be pretty far out because we have hard, we have strong rip currents around here. So it might take you so far out you can't get back. Boy. You ever seen a sign like this? I've seen that exact sign. This one? Yeah. Nice. Oh, that one. Have you seen that one? I haven't. Unseen currents have killed 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 82. Do not go near the water. And they're counting. Not you, go near, you can't beach. even go near it. The rip currents can sometimes jump out of the water and grab you. <laughs> <laughs> See, they're showing it here. See the rip current going in, and then you're going to swim to the side. How about it just save your life? So this chapter is all about currents. Make sure you read it. There could be a quiz on it tomorrow. No one was. 
No one was filming me? Just filming. Yeah, but you weren't like zooming in on stuff? I was. It's like you didn't. But after, after, after you started it. just standing there doing it, that's what I said. It's like you didn't even care, Tony. You can you can shut it off, read it tonight, enjoy. Wait.